Director and Associate Director of Curatorial Affairs of the Guggenheim Abu Dhabi Project at the Solomon R. Guggenheim Foundation. And I'm pleased to be here to talk with internationally renowned artist, Nick Cave. In today's social stereotypes and how works of art and the creative process can transcend stereotypes, breaking down boundaries and enabling the viewer to look deeper within the self. Today, Nick is speaking with us from his studio in Chicago, and although screens and time zones separate us, we hope you'll feel that you're in the same room through this virtual platform. Please share your questions for Nick in the chat uh, session uh, during this conversation, and in the final 15 minutes, Nick will answer as many of your questions as possible. As brief background, Nick Cave is an interdisciplinary artist and educator who works seamlessly in compass uh, sculpture, installation, performance, video, and sound. He began his formal studies at Kansas City Art Institute with a BFA and went on to graduate studies culminating in an MFA from the prestigious Cranbrook Academy of Art. Some among you may have seen one or more of the major solo exhibitions or performances of Nick's work at such venues as the Chicago Cultural Center, the Yerba Buena Center for the Arts in San Francisco, the Trapholt Museum of Modern Art in Denmark, Denver Art Museum in Colorado, New York's iconic landmark Grand Central Station, the Institute of Contemporary Art Boston, Queensland Gallery of Modern Art in Sydney, Australia, Mass MoCA in North Adams, Massachusetts, Carriage Works in Sydney, Akron Art Museum in Ohio, Tramway in Glasgow, Times Square in New York City, and the Park Avenue Armory also in New York. In addition to his visual art practice, since 1989, Nick has taught at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, where he is an endowed professor and department chair. His work is included in museum collections worldwide, including those of the Queensland Art Gallery, Museum of Contemporary Art Chicago, Brooklyn Museum, Museum of Modern Art New York, Philadelphia Museum of Art, San Francisco Museum of Art, and the National Gallery of Canada in Ottawa. So Nick, Let's begin our conversation today with the works for which you are best known, the sound suits. As a, a visual artist, your, your primary inspiration is to respond to injustice that is rooted in race, class, or gender. And you made the first sound suit in 1992 in response to the police beating of Rodney King in Los Angeles. And the concept of a suit, as we've talked about, associated with traditions of garments for ceremonies and rituals and masquerades, it's associated with identity, perception of others, as well as oneself. So to start, tell us about how your sculptural sound suits raise questions about identity. Hi, Sasha. Nice to be here with you today. <clears throat> Uh, you know, sound suits, you know, it's interesting when, um, you know, I think for me as an artist, you know, we never know what's going to trigger uh, a particular way in which we sort of, our work is directed. And so with, uh, you know, the first sound suit in response to the Rodney King incident in 1992, uh, this was a real critical turning point in my practice. <clears throat> you know, for me, I think that I was more or less trying to create something that was really hiding my identity at that particular time, uh, sheltering my existence, um, protecting my sort of uh, wellness. And so I started to build these uh, <clears throat> objects that would completely, completely adorn the body, uh, really hiding gender, race, class. Uh, and that was the beginning of me asking the question, what are we looking at? Mm -hmm. And how do we look at something without judgment? Uh, and I think when you, when identity is, and gender is removed, uh, and we're looking at something that is unfamiliar, 
we have to ask ourselves, how can we open ourselves up to, to a difference, to something other without judgment? So it really plays, you know, on the sort of psychic and how we see ourselves in the world and how do we sort of, how do we confront ourselves of, of things that perhaps aren't familiar or that may look different. I think also, Nick, what's so so interesting about the sound suits is that they they transcend assumptions about identity by literally and figuratively masking, you know, as you've just explained, race, class, and gender. And they allow us to take on new unexpected identities. They empower us if we're wearing them. And as viewers, they really invoke our power of imagination. Uh, so as we um, move to see the typologies and the range of sound suits that you've made over the years here, we're looking at uh, the earliest from about 1992, if I'm not mistaken, as well as some of the A-frames and armature works and buttons. And looking at these, we can, we can see that they're really constructed of a trove of unique found materials, including stuffed animals, toys, buttons, bottle caps, rugs, hair, even feathers, um, that really embellish the surface in, in an accretion of pattern and texture. So tell us about the process of creating a sound suit, like the ones that we uh, are, are, are okay. seeing here. Uh, you know, I think, you know, material becomes the language. Material becomes uh, <clears throat> a way of entering the work. Uh, material is uh, used as this device to adorn, to uh, uh, express, uh, uh, to uh, build. Um, and so I think I've always been interested in the discarded. I've always been interested in this idea of like surplus. And we live in a world where there is so much surplus. And so that becomes this amazing <clears throat> um, source of of materials that I can renegotiate how they may be used. Uh, you know, material becomes a way to build a three-dimensional cloth. Uh, so I'm not, I'm more interested in surplus as a way of building a cloth uh, that becomes an adornment uh, that is then applied to the body. Um, and so it's, you know, I'm, I, I spend a great deal of time at the flea markets, at antique malls, uh, at surplus stores, um, and really just sort of um, looking at this sort of survey of, of uh, availability and what's out there, uh, and then making choices uh, I may not know in that moment how I may use something, but it may be of interest enough that it will find its way into the work. I rarely use materials as they come. Mm. <clears throat> so I'm always sort of uh, uh, reimagining new ways in which uh, the surplus can be altered or applied. And, and so that allows for <clears throat> a different way to, to uh, uh, experience the work. I'm also interested in using materials as a way in. You know, there's a lot of found objects that are we're all familiar with, and, and that's a way into the work. <clears throat> Uh, that's my sort of introduction. And so for you to sort of explore and to really start to analyze and start to break down the sort of dynamics and, mm -hmm. and the way in which the works are built, you may find that you may run across a <clears throat> porcelain bird uh, that, you know, may bring back this sort of memory that uh, that recalls a moment in your grandmother's china cabinet. So 
it's really this sort of <clears throat> way, it's, it's, this, it's, it's a way to speak about time. It's a way to speak about uh, memory. It's a way to speak about uh, <clears throat> how one may feel about uh, of the decorative and as a way of of adornment, as a way of uh, in the sort of shamanistic sort of manner. Of course, it, so <clears throat> for these sculptures, you know, in, in terms of um, culling materials and constantly finding them and almost building a repository of them, if you will. Um, it, You've, you've said that there's a central object that's your starting point. It, it determines the rest of the piece and sort of becomes a signifier. You mentioned, for example, the example of a bird, um, a porcelain bird, and what that might evoke for you personally or for the viewer um, and a multiplicity of, 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 uh, of viewers for that matter. Um, can you tell us ab about um, how you build these? What's, in terms of the starting point and um, and culling materials that you've that you've created over time, and and whether when you look at the works that we're seeing here, for example, they they conjure specific memories of having collected uh, the materials that we see mm -hmm. in the resulting sculptural <laughs> forms. Well, you know, I think for me the piece that's um on the left, on the uh, uh, left is <clears throat> a piece that really came about when I lost my first grandfather. And so I lost my first grandfather. I also came across from my grandmother uh, this quilted family tree that she created. Uh, and so th that family tree, and then I sort of came, as I was thrifting uh, across a series of ceramic uh, birds, porcelain birds. And that also led me to think about you know, these sort of relics, these objects that I could only as a kid view from the China cabinet. I could not touch them. They were precious. They were viewed as this sort of decorative sort of Uh, and so all of that led me to thinking about the sound suit as this sort of uh, <clears throat> figure that also became the the beginning of uh, this tree of life. And so that is sort of how things start to sort of take off. It's really sort of an incident that may then sort of trigger uh, a particular object that all sort of falls and lines within the same sort of narrative. Uh, and so it's really me sort of, uh, again, celebrating uh, this sort of history, looking at this quilt that had all of this data about uh, the family structure, the my, my the uh, and so that was just sort of interesting to me to sort of to see that broken out, which mm -hmm. then became the branches, and so again that really then allowed me to start to think about this figure and history and the building of a family structure. Mm. It also seems it's so nice to hear your recollections and, you know, highly personal memories and anecdotes, really. But, you know, it also seems to me that the sound suits in general have, it, have an optimism that, that offsets the didactic elements. But really looking at uh, what's unique about the sound suits as an art form is that they can be both static and dynamic. That is, one can view them as we've seen in a museum context uh, or, or see them worn and enlivened in performance. Uh, mm -hmm. And in this way, they really you know, exemplify the ways in which your practice crosses the boundaries of visual art and performance. So let's discuss the performative. Tell us 
what it's like to wear a sound suit. You know, uh, to wear a sound suit, you know, it, it, it's really a process. And it's a process that is so enormously overwhelming. It's really sort of us, you, me, sort of me walking you through really this uh, therapeutic uh, transformation. You know, what I recommend when I'm working with a, a, a team of uh, amazing dancers, performers, is that we sit and we talk about the object in front of you. We talk about <clears throat> what are you seeing? I allow you to touch the material. I allow you to talk about what do you think the sound perhaps that it makes. We talk about perhaps what do you think about, you know, whether or not what the weight would be. Um, I have them pick elements up just to, so they can get a sense of the gravity of something. So the, the um, physical weight and what it's like on the body and yeah, the how the body's weight. constrained or liberated or. But it's really important in this process just to sit quietly mm. and ask yourself, are you ready to surrender? <clears throat> because the moment you put an element on is the moment that the transformation starts. And so it's so critical for you to be in the moment and open to the acceptance of what is about to occur. And so once you put the entire piece on, <coughs> excuse me, I have you stand still. And at that moment, we talk about the fact that who you were is no longer visible. You have now become something other. And then what does that mean? And so it really sort of is this sort of process that leads one, one step leads into the next. And so then you, then I allow you to slowly start to move uh, 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 and imagine, <clears throat> you know, here we're working in Queensland uh, on the performance piece Heard. <clears throat> uh, and I'm working with a group of 60 dancers. And so we go through an entire day of, of rehearsal and exercises. Uh, <clears throat> uh, you know, what type of horse do you want to be? What does that mean? What are you going to name your horse? How are you going to gallop? Mm -hmm. Are you a stallion? And so it's all of these ideas that you and your partner have to come together and really sort of negotiate and work all that out. Uh, so it's really, again, this building. But I'm telling you, the transformation is extraordinary um, when you surrender and become something other. And that's where everything becomes liberating at that moment, is that you can be whatever you need to be. You can project however and whatever that means to you at what scale uh and so for me i can be in the same sound suit that you could be in but we are going to come to that object very differently and so and that's the interesting thing for me is that i never <clears throat> ever have a final conclusion of how one may approach and become one with a particular sound. So because I have been surprised because everyone brings a different approach mm -hmm. to the work. And so it's always this sort of ongoing exercise and building and understanding and uh, imagining something knew that uh, that may inform uh, the object. So it's very interesting. 
And Nick, I think in, in speaking about this transformation and being in the moment and the impulse or, or the challenge of, of yielding to a new identity and exploring it, I think that brings us also to the role of, of dance as an <laughs> integral element in your practice. It's effectively another medium that you use. And we've talked about how you studied Alvinelli technique, but tell us how and why dance became a defining aspect for you. Well, I think, you know, as I was in undergrad school, uh, you know, I was making these objects that are to, to be worn by the body. And so the body became this, uh, <clears throat> it has always been the central uh, axle that I've always worked from. And so making these objects, bringing them to the body, well, the body moves. And so I've always been interested in dance as this additional tool <clears throat> and understanding the sort of foundation of dance. But I think that it's not, um, I'm not interested in <clears throat> dance from, uh, as opposed to movement. I think movement allows uh, a much more of a freer and more of an open sort of improvisational expression, which is really the permission that I give all the performers. Uh, and that allows, again, this sort of um, way in which you come to the work um, <clears throat> in these sort of extraordinary sort of ways that... Uh, that you may be responding to uh, scale. I talk about a lot about projection that, you know, one sort of simple gesture, depending on if you have raffia that's 15, uh, uh, 30 inches in extension in front of that movement, that that movement is going to take another uh, 10 seconds before the raffia arrives. Uh, in that sort of position. So again, projection, you know, how can you be larger than life? <clears throat> how can you stand at the edge of a of a stage and, and not move at all and just stand in your truth and be everything that you possibly can be in that moment? Mm -hmm. So it's really, again, just about posture, and really sort of, again, in giving yourself permission to completely be in that moment. <clears throat> it's Nick, fabulous. Fabulous indeed. And yeah. Nick, speaking of, of process and, and being in the moment though, how does dance affect your works in the gallery when there isn't, for example, a, a performance? Uh, does it affect you in shaping your, your exhibitions in this free, open, improvisational, expressional way that you've just described? Well, you know, I think for me, I think it all started, I think, you know, parallel to me making these objects and uh, uh, thinking about the more sculpture versus uh, these objects that can be worn for performance purposes. I also found myself at the Museum of Natural History uh, doing research. And, you know, I found myself looking at these artifacts. And as I was sort of looking and reading and, and doing the research, I realized that a lot of these artifacts served a purpose within a particular culture. And so, but yet I am forced to view these as relics, as, uh, as <clears throat> these uh, ceremonial dress, uh, as these uh, uniforms, as, uh, and so that was interesting to me that the role of purpose and function and, and, and yet, you know, that removed and viewed as a art object. 
Uh, so I was interested in the duality of both of those things. Mm -hmm. That I want you to come to an exhibition and to see these works static. And I want you in that moment to imagine what it would be like to, for this to be on the body and to imagine what that movement would look like. So I think part of my work has always been about that sort of space in between, like, you know, I've always had this sort of uh, <clears throat> way of thinking about the role of curiosity within how I see things, how I experience things. I mean, you know, we could be watching a performance, but still I'm not in the performance. So mm -hmm. I'm, again, another voyeur looking into it and only imagining what is that like being part of this ritual um, <clears throat> so so then happening. what about the didactic aspect of dis of disguise then is it well i think it's um <clears throat> i think you know disguise and and charade and masquerade you know i think we do that in our daily ritual in our daily existence you know i think about like teaching in the classroom what does that mean what does that look like and how do i look going into that setting as opposed to if i am <clears throat> receiving an award, what does this sort of drag look like? So dress has always been sort of this interesting play of, you know, the role of dress, the role of dress up, the role of, of <clears throat> masquerade uh, has always been, again, a part of a way of building identity, mm -hmm. a way of of uh, exploring uh, identity, uh, working <clears throat> outside within limits or, or no limits. Uh, this sort of, again, this sort of space of, of liberation and independence uh, the, or this sort of collective uh, <clears throat> Uh, sort of experience to be in a quorum of of individuals uh, collectively working and thinking in the same way about uh, performance, a right. way of, of hiding identity. So <clears throat> it becomes a number of things. Hmm. And Nick, you've you've in your performances that you just spoke about, you've worked with dance and university students, um, and an integral part of your practice really is the local community engagement that you've just described, specifically engaging entire communities in both spontaneous and choreographed performances, often with sound suits, uh, with music, uh, <coughs> dance, uh, movement in general. How does this part of your dual identity as visual artist and educator correspond to your goals? You know, I think for me, um, collaboration is, again, it's, it's a very critical part of my process. <clears throat> you know, space is very much a, a critical part of my process. The moment I take things outside and put them in the world, that is very different than what it looks like in the studio. I've always looked at the world outside as this open canvas. And so what does that mean? Like, whoa, I have this all the space to move and to work in. So I've always used that as, again, this extension of my studio practice, collaboration. <clears throat> I can't wear all of these suits at once. Well, you know, let me uh, pull together a team of 30 performers. And what does that what is that opportunity going to bring me on a stage? What is that opportunity 
going to bring me if we do an invasion, <clears throat> if we do, a, do um, uh, you know, uh, a happening. So these things are, again, sort of <clears throat> me imagining what it's what it could be what it looks like to be parading down the street in 30 sound suits what does that look like i mean you know it's like me going to sort of to run errands and then i sort of turn the corner and there's somebody dressed in a lobster suit promoting a restaurant <laughs> at that moment <clears throat> that alters my way of thinking so I'm interested in all of those sensations and those uh, <clears throat> devices that allow me to feel and to respond differently. So again, it's really about uh, dreaming. It's about imagining of what could be possible. It's about uh, learning. Uh, it's a laboratory. It's research. It's <clears throat> me sort of, uh, you know, I think for the most part, I know what the end result is to be, but it's the process in between that is everything. Mm -hmm. I mean, the experience experiences that these performers receive, the uh, <clears throat> the connection that they make with the audience, for me to sort of, to be able to present a platform for them to imagine what their future could look like. It's all of that is all folded into, let's say, that residency. So in in the midst of the work, you know, what the way that I work is that I will make the work in the studio, but I will hire the community to build the work. So it's collaborative from so, the outset. Oh, it's collaborative. It's like, yes, I know that I could bring my own dance company and, and all of that to a city and then perform the work. But it's more important for me to work with a community. And it's interesting how I have reintroduced communities to them back to themselves. It's amazing how many performers live on the same block and have never met each other. It's amazing how uh, wow. <clears throat> individuals that didn't know that they could be collaborating right so, so so in that sense your your works and your performances essentially bringing people together they become fora you know a forum for you know neighbors who don't necessarily know their neighbors meeting with each other or you know textile artists and dancers and musicians all collaborating together on this joint uh, project um that that really um uh, you know is the culmination of perhaps a year long residence that you may have done and your teaching but also the the collective experience of working together as a community yeah, and you know, and it's important to leave uh, imprint. Mm. Uh, I think that's the most important thing is that, you know, when I walk away, what am I leaving behind? And so that is, has been really, really important <clears throat> for me to think about uh, uh, the role of Civic, the role of civic responsibility, uh, <clears throat> and how can that be applied to uh, a creative experience? Mm -hmm. and, and in turning, speaking of civic responsibility, and, and in turning to your recent uh, most set, uh, most recent set of sound suits, uh, the newest works. For, for three decades, really, you've addressed poignant and, and urgent issues that have universal resonance, equity, inclusiveness, gun violence, race, <coughs> issues that very frankly persist in, in defining our times. How do your newest sound suits, which we're seeing here, evoke an elicit response to the present? 
Well, you know, you know, this new series of sound suits have uh, what you're seeing is not what they were supposed to be. I was working on a new series of sound suits that started uh, about a year and a half ago that was sound suit 2.0. <clears throat> and so it was me sort of reimagining as a 18 year old what a sound suit would have looked like year 2020. And so as an 18 year old, 2020 was like, you know, the future. It was like futuristic and just a whole different way of imagining <clears throat> um, what things would look like. And so I was sort of in the process of developing that body of work. <clears throat> and then uh, George Floyd happened. And so that sort of shifted everything. And, you know, sound suit uh, <clears throat> point uh, two was a different level of, was this level of excellence that I had not achieved. And I was imagining what that was. And so with George Floyd, what happened was all of a sudden, <clears throat> everything that was supposed to move me in this sort of uh, trajectory of sorts, all then was covered in this shroud of darkness. And so in these new sound suits, uh, <clears throat> there is this sort of layer that is then applied over the understructure. The flowers all read 846. Uh, it's not clear that that's what it is, but that it's the number 846. And so this is really where I'm at with the new sort of sound suits. And eventually I will work my way back out of that uh, <clears throat> moment and get back to sound suit uh, 2.0 and proceed to continue to move uh, that work forward. But again, we never know what's going to occur that will alter a, a way in which we're thinking about mm -hmm. uh, the work we're currently working on. So, so it's really all about reflection and equality. And I think, you know, what we're seeing in some of the <clears throat> detail views as you've just described is, you know, this, this darkness on top and lightness underneath but you know it's all about you know again you know this is the reality this is the world in which we're living in right now but at the same time i'm optimistic mm -hmm. i believe in a better existence for humanity and so no matter what that always comes through my work there's always beauty, there's always uh, <clears throat> a sort of forecast into something other. It may at moments be disrupted or interrupted by violence of some sort, but there's always this extraordinary uh, light that comes through the ashes. Mm. And I, you know, civic responsibility has has always underpinned your work from the outset. And and really, before we we open it up to questions, I'm sure our, our audience would like to know what you're working on now, uh, post these new sound suits that we've just looked at and and had the pleasure of previewing. But what's what's upcoming? When when you and I last spoke, Nick, 
you shared the bronze works that you're currently working on, and we're fortunate to have a sneak peek at photos of one of these works in progress. Uh, so thank you for sharing that with us. Perhaps that's a good starting point. Tell us about these new bronze works. Well, you know, I've always been interested in, <clears throat> again, thinking about, you know, the studio practice is always evolving. It's always sort of um, <clears throat> shifting medium, shifting uh, uh, the idea of accessibility. Who has access to my work? How does one have access to my work? And so I am now in the process of, of transitioning from <clears throat> the sounds that's being made of uh, discarded uh, materials, surplus, excess, and working solely in bronze. So what you're seeing now is the beginning of my first outdoor bronze. This sits about 10 feet uh, in the air. Uh, and massive so, in scale. And so it's, uh, as you see, I'm, I'm sort of thinking about, you know, again, sort of how do we, what do we transfer uh, from one medium to another and how do we do that? So here it's critical that the figure becomes adorned mm. as the work has always been about that. And so again, uh, working through processes and techniques to, uh, again, to bring embellishment. Again, we're bringing these uh, bird, uh, casting these bird figurines uh, uh, into bronze and again, placing them within this sort of structure, uh, the tree structure. Uh, and so again, it's, you know, the most important thing about this work is that it will live in the world. Mm. It will not live within the confines of an institution. It will live in the public realm. And so, you know, again, I think as an artist, it's very much committed to outreach and working within community. I'm interested in, you know, how can I physically get the work uh, in that kind of space as well. And so with the new bronze, I, you know, it's happening. I am so like, whoa, overwhelmed by just the results of what it's looking like. Well, how incredible to get a preview. Thank you. So essentially, I think what you're saying in terms of living outside the walls of a gallery or living outside of the context in which we see them here, photographed, you know, in process in the studio, unfinished. Uh, but these, so these are really public outdoor works, essentially. Are you able to share where they might live or uh, well, we, even in broad strokes? We can't quite yet. Okay, but we'll, we'll, uh, we'll stay tuned. Yeah, things are coming up. Uh, uh, but <clears throat> the fact that, you, you know, I'm, I'm able to make that transition into this new medium mm -hmm. is really uh, this amazing feat. Uh, because, you know, we're looking at it in this, through these images, but in person, it's even more dynamic. And so I'm so happy. And I've been trying to get to this point in my work probably within <clears throat> the last five years. And so I've been sort of doing works that have incorporated bronze uh, in the work, uh, but now to fully be immersed in the entire transformation is everything that I imagined plus more. And ultimately very much seems like the culmination of, of much of your lifelong commitment to reaching the community. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. So 
I think now it's time to opening it up to questions for the audience, Nick. Um, and we have several that have that have come in over the course. Um, I hope we will be able to address as many of them as possible. We will do our very best. Uh, how do you decide when one person has asked on the title of a work and when in the process of creation? That decision is, it really sort of depends. Uh, you know, let's just, like, for example, sound suit. I did not, that came about from the first sound suit that I made in response to the Rodney King in L.A. riots in 92. That, uh, you know, I was in the park sitting, really sort of trying to understand just what had happened the first time we were able to see a recording of an incident on our phones, which changed how, you know, we exist and what we as people of color have been talking about for generations uh, to now see that was everything. But, you know, for me, I was just thinking about the feeling of, you know, what does it feel like to be discarded, viewed less than, uh, uh, <clears throat> and so I was sitting on a bench and I looked down and there was a twig on the ground. And for some reason, I started collecting the twigs in the park. I uh, went home, got my shopping cart, came back, and proceeded to collect, went back to the studio and started to build this sculpture didn't even imagine that I could put it on my body. And the moment I put it on my body and started to move, it made sound. And so that's how sound suit came about because making sound led me to think about the role of protest. And in order to be heard, you gotta speak louder. So that became the mega phone for my existence was being able to move in this object and to make this rustling sound of urgency. And so that's how sounds came about. It was not, I had no idea that that was what it was until I actually physically moved in it. Now, some things come about uh, depending on uh, the project. You know, I th remember doing Until, which is this massive installation at Mass Mocha. Uh, and Denise Marconish, the curator, came to my studio and said, I want to invite you to do a project in Gallery 5, which was is the size of a football field. And she goes, but I'm going to go away from, for a year and I will come back uh, and ask you what it is that you would like to create. Within that year, I wasn't even thinking about the project at all. But then... Michael Brown happened. And I was sitting in the studio working. And as I was listening to NPR about that incident, I asked myself, I wonder if there's racism in heaven. And that was the beginning of that project titled Until. Guilty until proven innocent, innocent until proven guilty. And so again, it really sort of depends on what is going on in the moment, what may trigger something. Uh, but it's never, it never happens right from the top. So uh, another question that that is actually a, a beautiful segue as to what you were just referencing, the, the issues that you are confronting in your works are incredibly important and, and often rooted in, in tragedy. Are you ever tempted to make the didactic element stronger and more blatant? 
uh, well, I don't think, I think it's very blatant. I think it's very uh, strong if, if from my perspective, you know, it, this is just how I sort of have always sort of uh, approached my work. I think it's really sort of, I think I'm, I approach the work from trying to find a place of understanding, empathy, compassion. Uh, and so I think uh, what I'm up against is as blatant as it is. And so I think that that is, it can't be any more blatant than what the reality is. Mm -hmm. So some more questions that, that um, have come in. What is the role of the mystical and the mythical realm and the metaphorical in your work? Well, you know, I think that I've always been sort of, you know, I don't really sort of study this because uh, I don't want or do research around uh, this area uh, because I don't want to t uh, sort of affect or or or, or uh, what I am sort of psychologically and emotionally sort of naturally sort of feeling. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, the, the role of, you know, the shaman, shamanistic sort of beliefs. And, uh, but I think it's very, very present in the work. I think I know that I am nothing more than a messenger. Uh, and so I have been given these assignments to deliver these deeds. And so I really just, I will leave it at that. And so, you know, what I do doesn't belong to me. Mm. Uh, and so I'm not attached to any of what I do. I can release it and let it and, and allow it to do its work. Uh, and that is just sort of something that I have sort of come to terms with. Well, I think it's also something that, you know, is integral to your to your visual art practice, but goes hand in hand with uh, with your role as as educator, as mentor, as, uh, you know, community uh, uh, teacher, uh, if you will. Um, and as as, um, you know, someone who's bringing people together for these fora that are your performances. Another question that that um, has come in is uh, about how you choose the performers for your works. And we, we discussed earlier that many of them are, you know, local dancers, local musicians, but are they always students? Do you hold casting sessions or auditions? This person is asking. Oh, yeah, we we always hold casting. Uh, <clears throat> with any project, even if it's students. Uh, and so we do open calls. We, you know, in particular, if we're sort of working within uh, different cities. We come there, we do a uh, three-day open call. And so, and basically what we are interested in, you know, you know the starting point is <clears throat> we call you in and we say, dance and we and that's that's and then we sort of start from there and so we you know it's you know in your in in a dancer's brain they're like oh, what does that mean <laughs> but we're looking really for <clears throat> Uh, it's not really about necessarily the training, but 
you know, how do you, you know, how do you sort of come to movement <clears throat> and how do you identify yourself as a dancer and what distinguishes you from the next? Well, as follow-up to that, interestingly enough, another question from our audience is, what would you say is the hardest step for performers to initially grasp? <clears throat> I think for I think the hardest step is independence to sort of let go and to be expressive. You know, because I think we come from these very structured, uh, <clears throat> you know, dance sort of uh, foundations. And, you know, I'm more interested in that, but how do you, what is your improv perspective? So it's really, you know, it just, you know, when you, when you, when you're told that, <clears throat> You know, we are very, you know, we're interested in working with you, but we need you to be more <clears throat> uh, open, more sort of approach it for more of a sort of improvisational perspective, be more loose, free. Uh, and we really mean that. And don't be afraid of that. Well, I think that, that not so, being... <clears throat> yeah, and just be playful and uh, because that's going to allow you to be more accessible, mm -hmm. open to what is about to occur that you will not, that you're not going to be familiar with because your identity is no longer relevant. Right. So what have you, so what are you now becoming? And that's the spontaneity, I think, and also yeah. the individual aspects. Yeah, that... that's, the, that's that liberating part of like, whoa, okay, now I am something other. Mm -hmm. And the transformation that you talked about that comes with that. And so again, that, you know, that comes through these uh, improvisational classes, these workshops. Uh, and it's really just magnificent. Again, the process and giving people permission to be free and, oh, it's fabulous. Well, what a perfect way for us to confront and question the present and our role in it uh, and, and uh, really continue uh, onwards in terms of um, thinking about how we want to engage and participate and be part of the world and the times in which we live. So with that, I would, Nick, thank you. I would like to extend my special thanks to you for joining me today for this live conversation. And my thanks as well to the team behind the scenes in Abu Dhabi, London, Chicago, for making this program and live bro broadcast possible and seamless. We hope that you'll join us over the next two days for more Guggenheim talks and film screenings. I'll be back tomorrow at this same time with Guggenheim and Guggenheim Abu Dhabi collection artist Rayanne Tabit. And again, my special thanks to you, Nick Cave, for being with Thank us today. You. Thank you.